So we're going to get started. Um, just if anyone cares, I'm recording today's lecture for somebody who's away. Um, so if you don't want your voice recorded, don't speak up, I guess. Um, but anyway, um, topic nine today. I uh, might do this in one lecture. We'll see. We're going to talk about sterilization and disinfection. And so this is all about uh, what we're doing to kill microorganisms in the environment, right? And uh, as nurses, you'll probably be involved in a lot of this, right? You're disinfecting skin, you're disinfecting surfaces. And um, there's a lot, of, um, a lot of different techniques. They all kind of have their uses. Some of them, in fact, many of them you've probably seen somewhere in some context before, but maybe you didn't necessarily realize it. I know when we get to the disinfectants, there's a lot of different chemicals. We'll try to kind of give you good examples that are relevant and, and um, let you know what the important details are. I know there's a lot of chemical names, which probably mean nothing to most people unless you've got a little background in chemistry, right? Uh, but uh, I like chemistry, so I like to use those words and show the structures, but I'll try to, like I said, to let you know what I think is relevant uh, for, for what you need to know, okay? And like I said, kind of what is really relevant in many cases is what you're actually using it for, okay? Uh, you know, if you've got um, uh, somebody has, uh, uh, you know, been in a room and, uh, you know, the room needs to be disinfected because they had a contagious agent, you know, there are ways to deal with that, right? You're probably using a disinfectant and you're wiping it down. You're not going to be autoclaving the entire room. You might not know what an autoclave is yet, but we'll talk about that soon. You're going to see that's relevant in some cases, in some cases it is not. So before we get any further, some definitions, okay? Sterilization usually means you're killing everything, okay? So this is kind of the gold standard, um, killing everything. That thing is completely sterile. There should be no living microorganisms on that thing, whatever it is. Um, the only exception is maybe prions. Prions tend to be really resistant to all sorts of methods. The good news is they rarely ever come up, right? So we don't usually have to worry about prions unless maybe you're in the meat industry or something like that. Um, but um, so that's kind of the good news. So sterilization, that is the, like I said, the gold standard. You can see I have a little picture here of surgical equipment. You want that perfectly sterile because of course these things might be entering somebody's body. We don't want to be introducing pathogens there. Disinfection is where, you know, you're, you're trying to kill everything. Probably you're not going to be successful. And often we are referring to surfaces. So maybe you are disinfecting a countertop or somebody sneezed on their phone and you're disinfecting the phone or something like that. In many cases, when we say disinfection, we often mean uh, some sort of chemical that's being used to wipe down whatever it is. Okay, so that's usually kind of the distinction. And like I said, we'll get into a bunch of different methods and try to distinguish where some of them are useful because they all have, all have their methods and, and their uses. Sometimes people talk about sanitation. So sanitation is more of a public health kind of term that is used for uh, you know, reducing the number of microbes. There's not usually a guarantee that they're all gone. Right, so you know, if somebody is serving you food, for example, at a restaurant, um, you're hoping that they're not handling it with their fingers. Maybe they're they're handling it to you with tongs. So that's more sanitary because it's reducing the number of microbes that are being uh, transferred. If somebody is double dipping, that is not sanitary, right? Um, often it's used in public health, right? So water treatment. Uh, the other example I have is in restaurants. You know those. Those um, dishwashers are like at extremely hot temperatures. So this is gonna hopefully eliminate, not all, but a good chunk of the microorganisms that might be, uh, might be uh, kicking around. Um, so antisepsis is usually referring to skin, disinfection of the skin. In most cases, we're often talking about, uh, you know, before somebody gets an injection of, of some sort or something like that, right? So usually it's some sort of little alcohol swab or some other type of swab and the skin gets, you know, um, cleaned and disinfected uh, so that the puncture isn't going to introduce any pathogens. And one more for you, deduring. Uh, this is just kind of the physical removal of stuff, right? So you can imagine with bodily fluids, you could have vomit or mucus. Um, and there's going to be microorganisms maybe trapped in there. So just the actual fact of mopping it up or removing it, that's de-germing. 
And in many cases, we're talking about washing hands, right? So washing hands is, is amazing. You know, usually killing many things, but you're getting rid of what was on there and it's going down the drain. And of course, that's not going to get transmitted to someone else, hopefully. So all of these have their, um, all of these have their, 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 um, um, can't remember what I was going to say. What were you, what's the question? What's vegetative? Vegetative. Vegetative means growing, oh. right? Uh, versus like something in endospore form, which is kind of sleeping and dormant. Yeah. Um, okay. So first of all, how do we kill these things? All right. So we're targeting biological molecules. You can see number one says alteration of membrane permeability, right? So the membrane is on the surface of these organisms, unless it's a non-envelope virus. So it turns out that non-envelope viruses are harder to kill. So coronaviruses have envelopes, for example, and uh, it's easier to kill them than say norovirus, which doesn't have an envelope. Um, so we'll get to that a little bit later here, uh, but you've got the membrane. If you have something that can disrupt the membrane, then um, you can kill the thing, right? So for example, ethanol, that's what's found in these hand sanitizers. Um, I grabbed this one here. I was looking at it. I think it says on here somewhere, 75% al alcohol, right? So alcohol is a uh, organic compound and uh, it can actually interact with the phospholipids in the membrane. So you kind of have this sort of thing going on, right? And uh, so if, if you drink alcohol, we actually have an enzyme that breaks it down. So in small amounts, or if you're drinking kind of at a slow rate, your body sort of deals with it. If you drink at a faster rate, sometimes it can kind of affect your, uh, your phospholipids. At a really high level, it's toxic. At uh, sort of moderate levels, you know, sometimes that gets in and, and it actually affects um, um, your neurons. Your neurons have a lot of lipids uh, in those Schwann cells and, and it can kind of disrupt the, the pathways and slow things down. And, and uh, so that's, you know, part of being inebriated, right? But it's, it's affecting membranes. Uh, what else can we do? We can damage proteins. Uh, proteins are a big part of the biological functioning of organisms. Many of them are enzymes. If you can denature, that means um, you're melting, unfolding proteins, uh, you can stop them from living, right? The enzymes are allowing them to metabolize and consume food and do all their kind of things. Uh, lots of ways to do this. Heat is usually the method. And uh, we'll come back and talk about heat. Uh, sometimes pH, a lot of chemicals will interact with proteins as well. And like I said, it's just, you kind of, they, they can't do their thing and then they die, right? Uh, last method is nucleic acids. Okay, there's one method we're gonna talk about that's really good for destroying nucleic acids and that's using radiation, okay? Uh, so that, that's how we're gonna be killing these microorganisms. Um, another thing to think about is um, how effective these methods are gonna be. And they actually depend on quite a number of variables. One is the the inherent biology of the organism. So endospores are super tough, not quite as tough as prions, but you know, we're getting, you know, they're, they're very tough. They've got thick peptidoglycan. glycan. They've got chemicals designed to protect DNA. Um, endospores are very, very tough. So if you have something that can kill endospores, now you're kind of hitting that gold standard, right? Uh, like I said, prions don't usually come up in most medical situations, so we're not concerned about them, but they're even tougher than prions. Uh, you can see some other things that are tough. Remember the mycobacteria, right? Tuberculosis, the mycolic acids is that waxy substance that's protecting them from gram stains, uh, also protects them against all sorts of other things, disinfectants and so on. Uh, protozoan cysts, kind of like endospores, they got protective layers, not as tough as endospores. And, and uh, you can see there's this list goes on, right? So protozoa tend to be kind of tough. Gram negatives, uh, apparently a little tougher than gram positives. Again, they've got an extra membrane. So that gives them a little extra protective uh, uh, coating for disinfectants and things like that that, that can't, can't permeate because of an extra layer, right? Uh, you can see envelope viruses are the wimpiest things. Um, and so there's actually a lot of envelope viruses that really have a really hard time surviving outside of the human body and even or outside of bodily fluids. Like HIV, for example, is a very, very sensitive virus to uh, the environment, right? It does not really survive outside of bodily fluids very easily. Um, so like I said, a lot has to do with the biology of these things. Um, time to talk about C. diff. 
Okay, so we talked about a couple of clostridiums already. We talked about clostridium tetani, which causes tetanus, clostridium botulinum, which causes botulism. Uh, both of these are spore forming soil organisms. Uh, here's another clostridium. This one is not usually found in the soil, but found in the gut, but it is also a spore forming anaerobic organism. So it's clostridium difficile. Difficile, of course, means difficult. It's difficult to treat, right? Um, all sorts of different acronyms for it. Usually I, I hear everyone call it C. diff. Uh, sometimes I've seen this uh, in as an abbreviation CDF as well. Uh, so this here is found in the gut sometimes. Um, some of us here might be colonized, some of us may not be. Um, but those endospores are tough. And uh, in a hospital setting, uh, they're persistent in the environment and it's easy for people to get infected, right? So this is one of these hospital things that often this is where people are getting it, but can be from the environment. Uh, like I said, these endospores can be almost anywhere and um, associated with feces. Okay, um, of course, everything seems to be associated with feces sometimes. Uh, so this one here can live in your gut. And uh, like I said, some of us probably have it in your gut right now. And you're okay. Um, in small numbers, not a big deal. But this is kind of a big, uh, um, uh, like I said, in the environment, hard to get rid of, easily transmitted in a hospital because of uh, improper disinfection and sterilization techniques. Uh, also a major cause of something called antibiotic-induced diarrhea. So what's happening there? What happens is somebody gets treatment for something. Um, my, uh, my colleague actually had that. I'm trying to remember what he had. He had antibiotics for some sort of, I think it was an ear infection. And then suddenly he had C. diff. So the antibiotics, they kind of, they're very good at wiping out a lot of your flora, the natural organisms that are found in your gut, in your body. But C. diff has endospores, um, resistant to a lot of drugs, now suddenly has a chance to flourish. And when it does, it causes inflammation of the gut and leads to diarrhea, right? Uh, apparently very foul smelling, uh, like rotten egg smelling. Um, I, I, I don't know what it smells like, but I've had people tell me that they know it when they smell it. It's that bad. So um, this is one of these super bugs that's kind of on the increase. 15 years ago, nobody was talking about it, and suddenly now it's kind of everywhere, right? Uh, so something you'll probably have to deal with in, in your careers, unfortunately. So C. diff, we'll come back and talk about it a um, few times over the next, next couple of weeks. Um, so biology, the number of microbes as well. Uh, you know, if you have one norovirus that gets stuck up your nose, whatever. Right, you know, but what about a hundred? What about a thousand? Right, so sometimes that's important. The more microbes, obviously, the harder it is going to be to treat things. Right, if they're everywhere, all over this room, um, that's a big deal. Right, if there's just in a small little puddle over there, it's going to be easier to, to, to deal with. So that's that's kind of a big deal. Um, environmental things, right? So feces, mucus, all those kind of things can can be a, a big deal uh, for kind of disinfecting things. Right. Uh, exposure time, so generally more exposure time equals better killing. So if you are killing something using heat, right, how many seconds versus 20 minutes, right, 20 minutes is more likely to kill the thing. Same thing with exposure to chemicals, the longer exposure, the more likely it is to be effective, right, so that's another one as well. So let's get into the methods. Big one we want to talk about uh, right off the top here is um, is temperature. Uh, this is an old classic method for, um, for sterilizing things. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of different ways to do this with autoclave being the gold standard. So we're gonna talk about autoclaves a lot. Um, so what is heat doing? Heat is denaturing membranes, denaturing proteins. So this is kind of my little cartoon showing, you know, here's your protein. It's folded nice and neat. And as you heat it up, um, it unravels, right? So if you've, ever, um, if you've ever cooked an egg, you're actually observing that on your frying pan, right? So in this um, uncooked egg, you've got proteins that are found in the liquid portion and they're soluble. And as they heat and melt up, they unravel and tangle up and they get more gelatinous, right? And that's 
the proteins being denatured. So if you have a, um, an uncooked egg, believe it or not, it actually lasts a lot longer in your fridge than a cooked egg because there are actually antimicrobial enzymes in that egg that will keep it preserved a lot longer. Okay, so let's talk about heat. Um, some of this is going to overlap with like the food industry. So pasteurization is a good example of that. So pasteurization was named after Louis Pasteur, right? So he was looking at food spoilage as part of um, some of the things he was involved with. And uh, he was discovered that microorganisms can cause food spoilage. That was something where he was starting to make connections where if microorganisms can spoil food, then maybe they can do damage to humans, right? So that germ theory connection, he was part of all that historically. And uh, so the idea behind pasteurization, usually you're looking at liquids and um, uh, the idea is to, to, to treat things uh, a short amount of time with heat to hopefully kill all or most of the organisms, but hopefully not really uh, affect the taste too much, right? But cooked milk, is different than non-cooked milk. So just, just a short amount of uh, time, uh, may not kill everything necessarily, but uh, used in the milk industry, right? Um, so there's, there's different treatments. Um, usually in um, uh, what they're doing is the, uh, the liquid is, is going through a, a tube of some sort, right? And, and so the, the liquid is going through a certain speed. And so there's a certain length of that tube that's gonna be a certain temperature. Depending on the speed and the volume, you can do different treatments, right? So the hotter, the shorter, apparently the less that does to the taste. Um, again, I don't know a ton about, the, about that, although I do know it is, um, it is legally required for dairy products in Canada, right? Um, unless you are a dairy farmer with your own cows, you're allowed to drink that milk. I actually knew, went to school with somebody and that was the case. And she was like, unpasteurized milk. It's amazing, right? Uh, but again, it's a, it's a huge health risk because there are quite a number of, before pasteurization in Canada, um, actually a lot of people are getting ill and dying from unpasteurized milk because there are actually quite a number of potential pathogens that can end up in it. Um, yeah, this is why uh, it's not going to kill necessarily everything. Right, so the milk will eventually spoil. There are some thermophilic organisms or endospore forming organisms that may not get killed by the pasteurization. So eventually, you know, they might grow up a little bit and, and spoil the milk. This is why I don't know if anyone um, ever notices the best before dates. Like some people are like they're very, you know, strict about it. They throw the food out whether it's good or not. The best before dates are they're not really legislated. They're kind of just the food industry puts it in there as a guideline. And so I had a friend in high school and her parents owned a corner store. So they would have to take things off the shelf when the best before day came, but she knew all the items, right? She was like, you know, white milk is good for five days after the best before day. Chocolate milk goes bad on the day of, right? And so she knew everything. So, cause, cause they would just bring home the fridge if it was still, the food was still good. Um, so chocolate milk goes bad on the day of. Right, so why is that? There's all that sugar in there, it's promoting growth of microorganisms. So it tends to go bad a lot quicker than white milk. But I mean, I don't know if about you, chocolate milk never makes it to the best before day in my house. <laughs> so classic method is heating by boiling, right? If you've ever done any canning or jam making or whatever, that's usually part of the procedures if the jars are going on a you know, big, pot on your stove and you're boiling them for 15 minutes or whatever the protocol is. And uh, hopefully you're, you're killing everything. You may not kill everything, right? So again, you got those thermophilic organisms or endospore forming organisms that may pop up, right? So, um, you know, that's why when you open the thing six months later, it's always worth a sniff just in case. Uh, every once in a while, something will spoil, right? Uh, particularly, you know, these, there's food in there, right? Sometimes sugar, if you're making jam and other things that may, um, uh, may promote growth of, of these microorganisms. Um, but um, like I said, classical technique, um, still used for a lot of things. It's the endospores that we are concerned about the most. And um, in particularly, botulism, right? Um, we'll talk a little bit more about botulism later, but it is a anaerobic endospore forming organism. So if your food goes black, do not eat it, please. Um, every once in a while, have you ever seen it in a grocery store? Every once in a while you're in the can section and there's a can that's kind of bloated, right? Most grocery stores are good at getting rid of their, their stock, 
but once in a while you end up in an old, not very really well-maintained grocery store, and I've seen that, do not eat that one. Or if you find that in your cupboard, do not eat that one. It's botulism. That's going to kill you. Uh, we don't want to do that. So a bit more on botulism. So how do we deal with those endospores? Gold standard is the autoclave. So what is an autoclave? It is a machine that will take steam and it'll heat it up and also put it under pressure. So usually this, these are set at 121 degrees Celsius um, and um, 15 PSI. So that's the kind of pressure uh, that that's usually is the standard for autoclaves. Why that? Because that is good enough to kill most endospores after, in some cases, three minutes of treatment. In most cases, the protocols you're leaving it for 20 to 30 minutes just in case. Um, you just you know want to make sure things are really sterile. So you can see this is showing that the steam is coming in, it's hitting all the surfaces. You can use this for liquids, you can use this for solid things, anything that can tolerate steam, right? Um, some plastic things depends on the type of plastic. Some plastics will totally warp and, and, and this is not good. Um, other plastics are designed to withstand autoclaving. So when I was working in a lab, uh, there's all sorts of lab plastics that are designed to go through the autoclave for this exact reason. Every once in a while you put something through and it comes out, it's all warped and you're like, okay, I guess not that one, right? Um, but uh, so like I said, lots of liquids, um, you can put bedding, uh, surgical equipment, uh, all sorts of things in these autoclaves and they come in many, many shapes and sizes, right? Um, I'll show you some, some pictures of some autoclaves. So here is kind of a typical type of uh, autoclave that you might see in a, um, a research area or a hospital. You can see the types of things they're putting in there. It looks like towel or beddings. Uh, these containers probably have instruments in there. Um, you can put uh, growth media. This is usually what we do for growth media in the lab is we, we sterilize it in the autoclave before we pour it into test tubes or, or Petri dishes or anything like that. And uh, this one here, um, you know, you're going to crank that door shut. It's pressurized steam. You program the button and it usually, like I said, 30 minutes is usually the standard. If you have lots of stuff, sometimes you put a little bit longer just to make sure all the steam gets in there because the steam has to touch the thing in order for it to sterilize it. Uh, also, anything that can't get wet should, shouldn't go in here either, right? You don't want to put your, like, your iPhone through the autoclave, right, if you want to sterilize it. Um, but very, very useful. Um, here's one we have, uh, we have, I don't know how many we have here at the college. We've got about maybe five of them. Um, this is one of the ones on the bench top. So this is, you know, like about that big. And this is the one that we use most of the time, I would say for a number of things. And um, again, like I said, you've got all sorts of things. A lot of waste goes in there. Uh, sometimes we're sterilizing lab waste. Uh, sometimes we're, we're making media. All sorts of instruments can go in there. Very, very useful uh, autoclaves, right? There's a big one. Um, I guess they're used by NASA and other companies to seal gaskets on satellites and all this. I was reading about this and I, I guess that's a giant one at some, uh, um, some space company. And um, I was like, wow, okay. Initially, I didn't know what they were using it for until I read up on them, but I thought that one was kind of cool. So autoclave, gold standard, okay? So that's one of the things you need to know. Can't use it for everything. Okay, somebody um, has a mattress that is, uh, you know, there's bodily fluids on it. Probably not going to fit in the autoclave. Okay, so we'll we'll get to that. Um, like I said, I I, I want to talk about some scenarios here eventually. Uh, you can test the autoclave. We actually do this by um, you can buy these little spore vials that uh, you stick in the autoclave to make sure it worked. And then you stick it, uh, you, and then, then you let it grow at 37. And if it changes color, then you know the autoclave uh, needs, some, needs some maintenance, right? Uh, so just thought I'd show you that. It's kind of cool. We don't have to do that all the time. I think we only technically have to do it monthly or bi-monthly um, for regulations, because you got there's a special tape that you can put on your stuff that actually uh, changes color as well. But this is kind of the gold standard. This is what the Public Health Agency of Canada wants to see you doing on a periodic basis to make sure that it's functioning properly. So what about dry heat? If you have something that can't get wet. Um, there's lots of different types of dry heat. Um, same idea, you're denaturing proteins. Uh, kind of depends on what you're doing. 
Uh, I showed you the video before where the instrument was getting sterilized by going into the Bunsen burner. So that's one type of dry heat where you're just you're burning things, right? You're oxidizing it, you're destroying whatever it is. And this is used in some cases, right? Where you have um, some, uh, if there's something extremely infectious, there's incinerators that can go, that the bandages or whatnot can go in incinerators at really high security labs. They're dealing with Ebola or things like that. You know, you're gonna be incinerating a lot of things. Generally not necessarily done. Uh, other types of, of um, dry sterilization is hot air. So an oven uh, and you just heat things up. It just takes longer, right? You can kill these endospores in like three to five minutes. Um, if you heat them up in a dry oven at 100 degrees, it, it, it might take an hour or two, right? Depending on the, the species and what you're trying to do. But again, you might have things that can't get wet, so it has its uses, right? And uh, again, you're not gonna be probably doing this with plastic as well. Um, but um, again, depends on the type of plastic and all that. Oh yeah, here's a table kind of showing some comparison times, right? So um, bacillus subtilis, right? Um, autoclaving kills it in one minute, apparently, right? Uh, dry heat, 120 minutes. So like I said, it's a little slower, but it works and is, is used for some methods. Just not that often, kind of depends on what you're doing. I've, I've used it in the lab sometimes for things that can't get wet. And it's the kind of thing where you just stick it in the oven and come back the next day, right? Uh, what about low? Oh, yeah, question. Should we memorize that table with the terms? No. Okay. Yeah, just know that autoclaving is awesome. <laughs> Dry heat has its uses. Okay. Uh, what about cold temperatures, right? We're going to talk about sushi, right? I, mean, I think I mentioned it before. Um, freezing. Freezing is actually, it's a, it's a great, um, you know, we don't, we don't even think about it anymore, right? In terms of it as an innovation for food preservation, right? In terms of like what was done historically. Um, when you freeze things, uh, most multicellular organisms are going to die. Um, you're looking at ice crystals rupturing membranes. So what are we talking about? We're talking about things like parasites or historically maggots on food, right? So maggots are baby flies and they lay their eggs and the eggs are microscopic. And so meat gets frozen and you don't see these things, right? Obviously those things die from cooking as well, but if you're eating sushi, it's not getting cooked. So this is what we have to do for sushi in Canada. Legally, they have to freeze it. So usually what they do is flash freeze it, which means they're using like liquid nitrogen or something like that. And it's a really quick freezing process. Again, the whole idea is to not affect the taste and you know, because if you freeze it solid, it's kind of a whole different story, right? Uh, but that's what we do in Canada. We freeze the, we, it gets flash frozen, and hopefully it doesn't affect the taste too much. Sometimes people go to other countries where they may not be so strict with that kind of thing. I keep hearing about this freshwater sushi that people are eating in Mexico. That apparently it's really popular. Uh, they don't always flash freeze it. There was a case in, in Ontario where this biologist went down and big sushi lover and then he's like, I think there's something in my eye, right? And uh, so he's looking in the mirror and, and he, he pulled, out a, pulled out a worm, <laughs> right? And this guy had a biologist and was able to identify it and figure out where he got it from, right? <laughs> so anyway, these things happen once in a while. Um, so, you know, you should be safe with sushi in Canada, but just watch out where else you get it. Um, same thing though, like I said, with ground meat and things like that, freezing it all will kill the parasites if you're not um, if you're not cooking it. So what about fridges? Not really killing anything in a fridge. You're just kind of slowing growth down to a crawl. And so this is why we do it for food, because we know there's going to be bacteria and other things on your food, mold, fungi, whatever, and it's going to grow eventually. So hopefully you buy it and then you eat it kind of within that range of when it's supposed to last. You know, if it's lettuce, you got a few days. If it's mayonnaise, it's probably going to be good for 10 years, you know, um, and so on, right? Uh, some things might grow, right? 
some molds are going to grow on your cheese probably maybe listeria on your lunch meat so again you know those are the things to watch for uh, particularly lunch meats for the best before dates and things like that uh, or any meat that you might get you know i bought some chicken uh, not too long ago opened it on the best before date and i could just tell from the smell i was not going to eat that one right um, so watch out for this. This is not going to sterilize or disinfect. It's just going to slow things down. So you're sort of preserving things for the time being. So another physical method is also filtration. Um, so filtration, what you do is you have, uh, you have some sort of uh, media and it's got little pores through it. And hopefully the pores are too small to allow the pathogens through. But big enough to allow air or liquids through. So filtration is not really, um, like we use it once in the lab sometimes, like the autoclave, right? You know, if I have to autoclave something, it's gonna take 30 minutes plus a few minutes to heat up and plus another half an hour to cool off at the end. You know, looking at an hour and a half before I can have the stuff, right? So if I need to um, uh, sterilize a liquid kind of just a small amount, you can filter it and there's all sorts of different filtration systems you can get this is kind of an old classic one there's there's these other ones that uh, you get the filter it comes in a sterile package you attach it to a syringe you can put the liquid in a in a in a, in a sterile syringe and get and, and just push it through and um it you know takes me like three minutes right better than an hour and a half and i have to wait for something so use a lot in labs um some medical things are filtered Right, there's a lot of things like vaccines and things like that that you cannot um, put through an autoclave because it's going to denature proteins and whatnot. So these medical companies will, in many cases, filter these things before they're sent out to uh, consumers. Right, um, different sizes of filters. Most places use this size, 0.22 micrometers. Okay. You can see that this is not necessarily going to get at all the viruses. You're probably saying, well, why don't they just use this one? Well, right, these holes are so small. Try to get air or liquid through that. It's not very easy to do. Uh, filtration is used in a lot of places. Um, um, a lot of newer hospitals have the air filtered. Uh, any hospital that has a, um, a wing devoted to burns patients, usually that air is filtered because burns victims are extremely susceptible to skin infections. So they're gonna filter that air to try to prevent uh, those people from getting um, bacteria from the air on their, on their skin, right? Uh, you start to see this in a lot of other new buildings. Um, there's filters, for example, uh, McDonald Island, I believe has filters in their, uh, um, in their pool ventilation system. Also UV uh, treatment as well to try to, you know, You've got a lot of moisture trying to vent, vent mold, right? That's kind of a big, big deal in a, in, a, in a swimming pool kind of situation, right? Like I said, newer hospitals, you're starting to see this is kind of a standard thing. It's kind of hard to build in after you've built the building, but if it's a new wing or a new building, um, this is kind of becoming standard nowadays. Uh, there's a lot of these filters are called HEPA filters, okay? Uh, this is what HEPA stands for. Um, and we have, um, this is a biological safety cabinet that we have in the biology lab here. And um, uh, what, what you have here is a surface for working with, with microorganisms. And it's sucking all the air out, right? So that things aren't coming towards you and it gets filtered and the filter is small enough to keep those particles from getting discharged into the environment. Uh, so these are really common in labs that are working with high risk things. Um, we use it for high volumes, which is 25 mils or bigger, which is kind of a joke, but um, if it's not really a very large volume, but that's what we've decided what we're going to do here. And we have to legally have one for our lab license. And so, you know, we do, we do use it, but uh, again, we're not really working with anything too pathogenic. Uh, you're starting to see these HEPA filters advertised in all sorts of places. Like I said, buildings is a good one. Um, I saw them advertised on a vacuum cleaner. Um, and then believe it or not, I actually talked to a guy that sold HEPA filters and he told me that they're lying, the vacuum cleaners don't have HEPA filters, they're just, they're fakes and anyway. But the whole idea is to uh, pull, pull the microorganisms out of the, um, out of the air. Um, so again, sort of back to food, uh, classical methods, 
of food preservation include some desiccation. So desiccation means you're just drying it up. Uh, here's somebody who's drying up uh, what are those fish um, in the sun. The meat gets dried and there's less or no water. And so the microorganisms can't grow. Um, this is not what we should be using in healthcare settings because we've got endospores again, right? That are just gonna say, hey, I'm drying up. I'll just form an endospore. When the, when the moisture comes, I'll, I'll, I'll go vegetative all over again. So just throwing that one down there because it is a, um, it is a bad thing to do. And, and like I said, you know, with things like dressings and whatnot, uh, you know, this is why we can change them, right? They dry up and, uh, and all that. Okay, a couple more and then we'll, we'll take a, we'll take a um, Kahoot break. Um, last one I wanna talk about with that, that has to do with uh, something physical is radiation. Okay, so radiation can damage DNA. Um, and this is good for all sorts of things, but plastics in particular are a great thing to treat with radiation, okay? Because uh, you can't put them in the autoclave. Sometimes you don't want things that are wet. And, and you know what? It's, it's very easy to do as well uh, in, in many cases. There are different types of radiation. Um, usually we break it into non-ionizing and ionizing. If you know a little bit about chemistry, an ion is where you've got a charge. So ionizing radiation will actually break chemical bonds and leave a charge on one thing or another. We're talking about high intensity stuff. Uh, I think we've got a slide on this high intensity stuff here in a moment, but this is kind of where radiation falls, right? So in the low energy radiation end of things, you've got like radio waves, which are not gonna give you cancer. They, they don't do anything to DNA. Um, microwaves, which will heat up water. That's how your microwave works. And then you're kind of getting into this higher energy. So infra, infrared, visible, ultraviolet. Now you're starting to talk about DNA damage kind of in this range here at the, at the UV, right? So we know we might want to wear sunscreen or don't get too much exposure to the sun because uh, it can lead to cancers. And then over here, x-rays and gamma rays. Um, now we're talking about really intense high energy stuff. So ionizing falls in right about there. Um, here's my ionizing radiation. So X-rays and gamma rays, um, you know, these are, are really high intensity things and some of the UV. So UVB and UV, UVC is the higher energy stuff that is, um, that is more likely to cause DNA damage, which can lead to, in our, you know, in our cases, we think about cancer a lot. So a lot, these are used in all sorts of things, right? Um, all sorts of processes. X-rays is obviously a big one. You probably know if you've had an X-ray, right? You're gonna, you know, they usually put the shield on you or they shield the part of your body that's not getting the X-ray because they're trying to minimize exposure to where you don't need it. And the, the technician, he or she usually goes around the corner or to another room to press the button because if they're doing this all day, they don't wanna have that extra exposure, right? Because it can, can uh, cause, uh, cause damage to, uh, to DNA, of course, right? Um, there's the um, there's a reminder of that. And often you're seeing um, these hazard warnings on them. Uh, radiation advice devices that use high energy radiation usually require a license. Uh, we have an X-ray fluorescence uh, instrument down in our environmental lab, and I had to get a license to operate it, right? So I had to get a photo and I think I had to prove my identity with ID and it goes to the government and I had to take a course and all that. And that's usually the case with these things that have this particular symbol on it. Uh, one use of high energy ionizing radiation that's starting to gain some popularity is, uh, is food irradiation. So what is the whole idea here, right? Um, you've got food, the food probably has bacteria, maybe fungi on it and um, they're gonna cause spoilage. So what do we do? We hit them with that ionizing energy. It's going to damage their DNA. It doesn't necessarily kill them. It just makes it so that they can't really reproduce. Um, and so they don't. And you can see this example here of some irradiated strawberries versus some non-irradiated strawberries. Um, this is one of these things that's kind of funny because there's a lot of misunderstanding about this on the internet. People think that if you have irradiated food, you're going to like it's radioactive or something. No, it's like an x-ray. As soon as you turn it off, the radiation is gone, right? So it hits the food, damages the DNA of the microorganisms, and then that's kind of the end of it. 
Um, there's an international symbol for it. And I'm not sure in Canada, but in the States, I think it's legally required on irradiated food, I guess, so that you can have the choice as a consumer. In Canada, I was just looking this up. These are the only items that are approved for food irradiation. I don't know how you get approval or why they approve or don't approve things. Um, but like I said, it's not something we need to worry about, uh, despite some of the rumors on the internet to the contrary. Okay, let's talk about um, UVA and the UV stuff, because a lot of sterilization is UV based. Um, UVA is the lower energy UV radiation. This is the stuff that uh, may not necessarily uh, give you cancer, but it might give you wrinkles. So it's kind of, you know, it just depends on that amount of energy and how, how deep it's penetrating into your skin. Um, but it uh, can also damage DNA and actually doesn't cause ions, but sometimes does some bond rearrangement. I'll show you, I think we've got a picture here of something that can happen. So you can see there's two thiamines, the two Ts. And what it does is it loosens these things called pi bonds. And the pi bonds are kind of the, the bonds on the edge and they rearrange themselves and they, they attach to one another. So this is called a thymine dimer, right? And there's a whole bunch of different mechanisms. This is just one. And now what you have is some damaged DNA and that microorganism can't grow. Or in the case of a human, this, this could be causing damage to one of your genes and, and, can, lead, and, you know, and can lead to cancer. But this is often what uh, a lot of um, these sterilization methods are is UV based. Um, a lot of them are actually on the higher end, the UV, B and C, because uh, they are stronger, higher energy intensity kind of things. Um, and I'll show you some examples here. Um, I found this one here on the internet. Um, this, this UV sterilizer, they were advertising it towards nail salons. So I've never been to a nail salon, but I imagine they have instruments Slippers and stuff they might be trying to sterilize that they're putting in there. So anyway, I'm not really sure, um, but you can, you can, uh, I had one in a lab a while ago that was, that was something like that. Um, there was also, I saw some mentions of things like this plastic wear uh, and a lot of these syringes and things like that, they will come in a, in a sealed sterile package and at the factory, they're UV sterilized in many cases because it's dry and um, it doesn't warp the plastic, right? For something disposable like this, you don't want an expensive plastic because you're just throwing it out. So why have it autoclave proof, right? You're gonna use UV or there's, there's one other method that, this, that they could use as well. Uh, Petri dishes, you know, same thing, plastic. So lots and lots of plastics. Um, if you look around on the internet, there's all sorts of products out there. I saw this one as well on Amazon. Um, it was advertising it for you could bring it to your hotel room and disinfect the remote and disinfect the bed and disinfect, you know, that's what they're advertising it for anyway. Um, you do see these, um, these UV lamps in all sorts of places, like at the water treatment plants. Um, that's kind of the last step, right, is uh, they've done all the chlorination and all those kind of things. And then they hit it with UV as kind of a, an extra thing to do because setting up a UV room is, is pretty cheap, right? You just need a little bit of space and you need these, these big high powered uh, UV lamps. Um, Germicidal lamps in a lot of uh, buildings, like I said, Mac Island, they have this in the pool system. Again, you know, they're worried about mold and things like that. It's kind of a standard thing to put in new swimming pools nowadays and um, at new hospitals and, and particularly uh, like I said, burns um, units will often have these as well as an extra method to uh, try to disinfect the air. Okay, I think I have a Kahoot here. Okay, I do. So I'm just gonna give you half of it for now and then half of it in a few minutes, okay? So I think I've got eight questions. I'm gonna give it four now and then four in a bit. Thank you. 
Okay, there we go. Okay, here we go. Like I said, we're just going to do four. You can keep your app open and we'll do the other four in a few minutes. What is sterilization? That's the wrong one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good answer. I hope nobody's destroying all life forms, right? I think that happened in one of the Planet of the Apes movies, right? But uh, we're not going to do that, hopefully. Okay. Good job. True or false? Envelope viruses are more resistant to disinfectants than protocysts. False. Okay. So more resistant is false because they are susceptible, which means they're wimpy. Okay. And remember that envelope viruses are the wimp were the wimpiest thing on the list. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay switching things up a little bit here dry heat sterilization is used for Items that cannot get wet. Okay, that was an easy one. Okay, one more for now. Ionizing radiation is high energy and non-ionizing radiation is lower energy. All right, true, okay. So like I said, I'm going to leave this up and uh, we'll uh, do the other questions in, in a bit here, but it uh, looks like Q is doing well. So good job, Q. All right, so what, 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 I've, what I've been talking about so far has been physical methods of control of, um, of environmental microorganism control, right? So generally, Autoclave, unless you can't do an autoclave, right? So small things that can get wet and can and can um, tolerate the temperatures, autoclave is the thing to do. Something that can't get wet or whatever, often it's UV sterilization um, is a big one nowadays. Like I said, you can get these little sterilizers; they're very easy to use. You just stick the thing in, shut the shut the door almost like a microwave is a timer and that's kind of the end of it. Um, and then sometimes a few of these other things might end up in there. Like I said, in the food industry, you're looking at some things going on, uh, pasteurization and freezing and things like that are, are, are very good. Filtration sometimes has its uses for air and, uh, and, and certain liquids. Um, but well, many of these things autoclave, right? Now, can't always do this for everything, right? If you have to um, disinfect an entire room, uh, you're not going to stick that room in the autoclave, okay? So this is kind of where the uh, disinfectants start to come in. 
And uh, so there's a whole bunch of different products. I know this is a huge long list. Like I said, a lot of these you've probably seen somewhere before, but you didn't know. Okay, so that's kind of the good news. And the other good news is, is that kind of, you know, a third of these are not really that common to use. So we're going to try to, like I said, point out the, the best ones on here and, and talk about where they, they pop in. Okay, so again, a little bit of chemistry for you. Uh, phenol uh, is a disinfectant. It's, it's one of the earlier disinfectants. It was actually used by Joseph Lister. And it is a nasty, nasty chemical. I used to use it in this one lab and I'd have a headache every time. Um, and you're worried about getting it on your skin because it can burn your skin. But hey, it's effective, right? It works really, really well. Uh, so a lot of things are using these phenolics now, which are not quite as nasty, um, but they all have a couple of properties that are worth it to know. One is they're persistent chemicals. That means they stick around. So that makes them very good at what they're doing because um, they stick around. Two, they're often kind of smelly. So a lot of these products, they often throw uh, something in there to make it smell nicer, like lemon is pretty common. I'll show you some products here in a second. Um, these basically react with proteins, by the way, um, and, and denature proteins, but they will also denature membranes. I think they can, they're also strong enough to, uh, to affect nucleic acids as well. Uh, here's some products. Um, Lysol, uh, so Lysol, by the way, is a brand with about a thousand products, but some of them have phenolics in them, okay? Um, you can see this one here. In fact, the Lysol website, you know, I was looking for all sorts of information about their products and it's really hard to find it on their website um, in terms of which products have which things in them. I was gonna show you, I, I, I found this here, right? So these Lysol wipes and I'm like, oh, okay. It kills 99% of viruses and bacteria. And it says it kills the one that causes COVID-19 right on. On the back, it tells you that uh, in four minutes, it'll kill all of these organisms here. And uh, in 30 seconds, it will kill these ones, right? So all this useful information, active products or active ingredients, not on here. Go to their website, go to their website. It tells you how these are biodegradable and and how they're uh, persistent. I couldn't find that information. I had to find it on a non-Lysol website. It told me it was in it. Uh, this one does not have a phenolic in it. Um, this one has an alcohol in it, but we'll talk about alcohols in a minute. But this, the, the standard Lysol, the classic one, uh, smells like a lemon, because like I said, the phenolics can have, have an odor to them. Um, pine sol is another one. A lot of things that have sol in them, right? The all for phenol, I don't know why the S, maybe it's phenols, I'm not sure why the S in there, um, have, uh, have, have uh, these phenolics in them. Uh, you may have heard of triclosan as well. Uh, it's popped up in the news the last couple of years because the Canadian government banned it in some products, just concerns about um, it being overused and, and certain uh, organisms becoming resistant to it and, and all that. But it's found a lot of cosmetics uh, I don't know if it's still found in toothpaste, but it used to be found in toothpaste. A lot of um, cosmetics and that uh, you might be applying on your face and whatnot. Um, I saw um, a yoga mat that had it in it, right? So uh, I don't know a lot about yoga mats, but I could imagine they probably get smelly after, after a little bit of use, right? Um, and that's from bacteria growing on them. So we're trying to prevent uh, these organisms from growing. This is actually from some, some antibacterial dish soap I think this is one of the products that's been banned in, um, but you can still see it uh, uh, on the picture and, and in many cases. So that's what, the, what phenolics are. Like I said, they have their uses. They're using a lot of these things. Um, I think Mr. Clean used to have it in it. I'm not sure if it still does. I used to have Mr. Clean on this slide, but when I looked up in the ingredients, it doesn't seem, I couldn't find it there. I think it used to have it, um, but another product that has the lemon smell, right? So the phenolics are really um, persistent, right? Uh, sometimes we don't want that. Sometimes we want things to evaporate away. So this is where the alcohols come in. Um, hand sanitizers, I was showing you this one here is, uh, what it was, 75%? Yeah, 75% alcohol. It doesn't tell me what kind of alcohol on here, um, but usually you're looking at ethanol or isopropanol. Um, you can look up the chemical structures if you want. Ethanol is, uh, is not quite as um, strong 
um, but it, it, it works. Um, usually you're looking at 65 to 70%, that's 75%. Again, I don't know, it could be isopropanol, isopropanol a little bit higher. For some reason, 100% is not as good as 75%, right? This is where the science comes in. Somebody did the study and they found that, you know, having a little bit of water in there actually makes it more effective than having pure uh, ethanol. And this is just mostly disrupting membrane lipids, uh, might denature some proteins, some stronger alcohols. There's a lot of really strong alcohols, propanol, and things like that, but you don't, you don't want that on your skin, right? Uh, these two are, are okay on your skin. You see them in a lot of these um, um, alcohol swabs and first aid kits and other places. And like I said, the, the good thing about it is it works really well um, for a lot of things um, and it evaporates away. Does not work for non-enveloped um, viruses. So it's okay, works for many things. Um, but it's, it's good, it's cheap too. That's the other thing, right? It's very, very cheap. And so uh, we can mass produce it very easily. Uh, it's gonna show you um, a couple of things to say about uh, hand sanitizers and stuff. Question? What's volatile? Volatile means evaporates very easily, yeah. Um, lots and lots of studies on hand sanitizers and things like that. I um, guess I forgot about this slide here, but this is just saying that the the not 100% is better than, than, um, than 100%. But you can see this thing they're talking about, soap and water is more effective. Um, so I wanna show you a couple of studies I was looking up. Uh, sorry, I'll get back to that in a second. Oh, where's my studies? Oh, I have them with the hand washing. Okay, we'll come back to, come back to this in a minute about hand washing. Um, the other thing I was gonna say is tons of products with, with alcohols in them. Uh, you may be familiar with cavi wipes. They're kind of taken over the hospitals um, as, you know, I don't know if they're a, a standard again in terms of disinfectants or whatnot, but you can see they have two different alcohols in them, right? Isopropanol and uh, but butoxy ethanol, uh, which is um, uh, a pretty strong uh, solvent and, and, and quite effective. And uh, there's, there's different formulation of these. Uh, if I was going to the website and again, it's making all those claims, right? Kills tuberculosis in X number of minutes and so on. Um, so they're trying to tell you how good their product is, I guess, right? But there are other brands. This is just kind of the one that you see everywhere. So notice we were just saying alcohols are the, are the um, active ingredient. Every once in a while, I do see hand sanitizers that say alcohol free. You should be suspect of most of those, okay? There are a few that might work. I found this one on the internet and there are studies that show that cinnamon oil can kill bacteria, right? I don't know how effective this product actually is, but they're trying to cater towards people that I guess, again, you know, some people don't want alcohol for some reason on their skin. Um, it's not harmful to your skin. It's not getting in your body. It's uh, not penetrating that first layer at all. It's evaporating before it gets very far. Um, another group are the halogens. Um, this includes a bunch of different compounds. We could talk about fluorine and things like that, which are really reactive compounds. Uh, kind of the two big ones are iodine and chlorine. Uh, these are um, halogens are a group on the periodic table of elements and quite reactive compounds. A lot of first aid kits used to have iodine in them. Uh, don't see it so much anymore, but people would disinfect their wounds by pouring iodine on it to try to clean them um, before doing first aid. Uh, you still see iodine in, um, it's the active ingredient in those uh, little tablets you can get if you go camping or hiking and you have those water purification tablets. Um, sometimes people call them iodine tablets because that's the active ingredient in, in a lot of them. Um, so you still kind of see that here and there. Like I said, not so common anymore. I guess there's just other things like uh, hydrogen peroxide is often used, but bleach has chlorine in it. And so you know, this is a disinfectant. You've probably heard that water gets chlorinated, right? Uh, swimming pools get chlorinated uh, and chlorine is, uh, it's, it's relatively reactive. It reacts with proteins. Um, it's something that uh, usually doesn't, um, you know, affect human skin too badly in, in low concentrations, but does a decent job at inhibit, inhibiting microbial growth. It's really good for water treatment because it's persistent, persistent enough that they add it at the, at the plant and it'll last going through the pipes and make it to your, to your tap. And um, there's, there's different formulations. I think in the notes I talk about chloramines, that's what we use in Fort McMurray. It's a little more persistent because in Fort McMurray, they do water treatment 
And um, some of that sits in tanks and goes to the camp. So they need something that's a little more persistent. Uh, and and uh, even though it's slightly less effective, but um, still works quite well. Uh, I mentioned hydrogen peroxide. It seems to be a little bit more common in these first aid kits nowadays, probably because it doesn't make as much of a mess as iodine, iodine can stain, but I don't know why it's really replaced as a thing. Um, uh, ozone is another one that sort of falls in this group. We call these oxidizing agents. So reactive oxygen compounds. Um, again, like I said, first aid, ozone is often used in water treatment in some places. Uh, not in Fort McMurray, but there are places that use ozone as a water treatment, and it's a, it's a it just it just scorches proteins. It, it reacts with them, they denature, they break down. Uh, very very effective. Um, uh, also very dangerous, which is why not all water treatment plants want to use it. But it is very very effective. Um, hydrogen peroxide. Um, the good news about these effective against endospores, right? So sometimes that's a big deal if you're concerned about uh, C diff. Right, there's a patient in a room that had C. diff, and you're concerned about endospores. Scrubbing with hydrogen peroxide is kind of the thing to do. Okay, I told you we we're going to talk about hand washing. I guess I should have put that back to back with the hand sanitizer, right? So, you know, here's a, a cartoon that, um, you know, I don't know how many people wish we had this in every washroom, <laughs> right? Um, you know, but. Um, it's just, just a good idea to wash your hands, right? Uh, in many contexts, right? Wash your hands is good. Although I know at the beginning of the pandemic, um, some people, myself included, I was washing my hands so much things were getting a little sore. But uh, anyway, it's it's good. Uh, what, what you're mostly doing with, um, um, so you can see this word surfactant, which sometimes has different contexts, but in this context, in terms of chemicals, we're talking about detergents and soaps. So they kind of have different meanings in a chemistry term. A soap um, generally tends to not always have a charge. A detergent has a charge. Um, often we may say detergent, it's a little bit more um, effective than a soap, right? But they kind of, the words are used somewhat interchangeably. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them out there. But what, what you're doing is you have these kind of unique molecules that have these hydrophobic zones and these hydrophilic zones so what does that mean? It means they can emulsify or they can dissolve greasy things, but also interact with water so you can wash it away. All right. So if you think about your hand, you know, you've, you, you could, we, we make little oils on our, on our skin called sebum, but you might have dirt, you might have, uh, you know, food grease, all these things can trap, trap pathogens. So hand washing or is mostly degerming. You're just kind of getting rid of what was there and it's going down the sink. It doesn't necessarily kill them. They can, these things can interact and, and damage membranes. The harsher detergents are good at doing that, but generally you're, you're degerming, right? And that's kind of the whole big thing of why hand washing is a big deal. If you can get rid of most of the microorganisms by hand washing, then awesome. So if you ever work in a surgical uh, ward, um, you know, they have, um, you know, mandatory hand washing protocols, you know, there's a timer, there's techniques, you know, with the scrub brush, you know, trying to get under the nails. Uh, in some cases, uh, it has to be witnessed that you hand washed and all these kind of things. And, and sometimes that's the case where we should be doing a little bit more of that. Um, it's kind of funny to think only recently, um, it's been routine for physicians to wash their hands between patients. Like that is a very recent thing. It's amazing to see that, um, but you see it now all the time. They wash their hands after, after seeing a patient. I, I don't know why that was not routine a long time ago, but it kind of makes sense. Um, some of them have um, other agents in them that are, that are important. I'll show you a couple of studies. This is, this, you know, these kind of things are really interesting. Here was one done on college students, right? So 51 students, so 102 hands, because we have two hands. And um, here's some of the, uh, the results they found. Uh, 4,700 species. So that's pretty cool. That's a lot of different organisms. Uh, again, no surprise, right? You know, our hands are everywhere. Some of us are, you know, working in the garden in the dirt. Some of us have babies where you're changing diapers. Some of us are using, you know, handling different kinds of foods. So huge, huge amount of variety there. Um, average hand, about 150 different species. Um, right and left hand, different. Again, no surprise, right? We do different things with our different hands. 
and uh, women's hands had a greater variety, right? So, yeah, why is that? No one wants to say it, right? You know, because the women are doing all the work, right? You know, <laughs> yeah, uh, it's it's kind of true, right? If you do, if you if you look at an average household, right, in terms of you know the the chore balance between men and women, right? Women are more likely to do the dishes, change diapers, and a few other things that may involve bacteria, right? Uh, just on on average. I'm not saying that's always true. I'm just saying, in general, there's a lot of studies that show that's the case. Um, so what about soap versus hand sanitizer? There's like hundreds of studies done on this thing, and it is so hard to do a good study. Like, how do you do this? Do you have to monitor, like, and watch every person wa washing your hands, using hand sanitizer, using it right? What technique are you using? How many minutes? How many seconds? You know, all these kind of things. It's very hard to do these kind of things. Here's a daycare where they, they try to do an intervention, right? So they had three groups, right? Um, no intervention, intense hand sanitizer, intense soap and water. In this case, they actually found the hand sanitizer group was a little bit better. Again, here's the question, right? Did they have a hand sanitizer everywhere? Like every, every two feet, did they have a, have a bottle? And, and in fact, that was the case. They kind of admitted at the end of the study that you know each classroom or, or daycare room had one sink, but then several body, bottles of hand sanitizer. So as soon as people are walking by and they've been told, you know, we're doing a study, they see the thing and they're automatically doing their hands, whereas the, the sink is on the other end. Um, but you can see, like I said, some of, some of the results here. Here's another one, right? Um, this one is talking about influenza and uh, they were able to show that the hand washing was, was, was doing better. Um, generally though, the studies do show that the hand washing is probably a little bit better than the hand sanitizing because some microorganisms are not, um, the, the effectiveness of hand sanitizers is, is not as good. Plus there's technique, right? When you're washing your hands, you're, most people are a little bit more likely to do a better job. You know, you get that soap on your hand and, and you got to get it all off. Hand sanitizer, it's very easy to have a very tiny squirt and, you know, right? So technique's important. If you're doing this versus, you know, kind of getting all around, all those kind of things can, can make a big deal. Like I said, it's hard to do these kind of studies. Um, I think I said some of these things here, right? Uh, not all hand sanitizers are born equal, but then again, not all soaps are either, right? Uh, depends on the germ. Again, hand sanitizers, right? Norovirus, Giardia, things with endospores, all these things, hand sanitizers are not so good, right? Um, but better than nothing, right? So you can see the college obviously invested in these things. I see them around the hallway, right? So trying to, trying to get people to not get other people sick. Um, so one more thing to kind of say about detergents. I told you some of them are really strong, um, meaning often they have charge groups on them. Uh, this one here you see everywhere. This one here, benzyl alkalinium chloride. Uh, I was looking at these products. Apparently that's the active ingredient in these things according to the non-Lysol website. Um, the college invested in a bunch of these things here. And that's the active ingredient as well. Uh, these were all over the classrooms last year. And uh, that's the first active ingredient on here um, is this particular deter detergent. Uh, oops. And then you can see on these wipes. So this one here is strong enough that it will actually interact and destroy membranes. So it's a good, it's not just de-germing, but now we're getting to disinfection, which is, which is good, right? Um, back to the cavi wipes. Two alcohols, that doesn't do the job. We'll throw in, we'll throw in this detergent as well, right? So, you know, this might be why they're why they're so effective. Again, I imagine these numbers are all based on some studies they did to try to promote their product. Um, but um, like I said, for some reason these things seem to be really popular nowadays in, in healthcare settings. So they I'm assuming that must mean they're good. Either that or cheap. <laughs> right? Sometimes budget is a big thing. Um, these are often there's a bunch of these. By the way, they're often called quaternium uh, uh, ammonium compounds. But you know what? This is the one that I see like 99% of the time, right? This benzalkalinium chloride, it's like, it's in everything, it seems lately, that, that involves some sort of disinfectant. Okay, so a few more to, to, uh, to mention here. Um, there's, there's another group of, of compounds, heavy metals. Uh, some of these are super toxic. 
Mercury, by the way, used to be used as a sterilizer for certain things. We don't want to do that now, do we? Right? Um, we can, it's a very toxic uh, question. Okay. Um, but there's a bunch of these out there. Uh, you can see this is showing some old pennies. So old pennies used to actually have copper in them, right? And you stick them on this, um, this Petri dish and it's actually killing and there's a zone of inhibition around the penny, right? Uh, we used to, um, so this is still, something similar is still done, but when, when babies are born, um, one of the concerns is eye infections. In particular, they're most concerned about gonorrhea because gonorrhea uh, can be transmitted from the mother to baby and it can actually lead to blindness. Now, that's something usually they, they test women for, um, for sexually transmitted infections to look for that kind of thing to go to the baby, but kind of as a precaution against other infections too, um, they used to put silver nitrate in the baby's eyes, um, which is a very good uh, disinfectant. Nowadays, they use antibiotics, right? Um, silver nitrate is expensive. Uh, you get a jar like, like this big of silver nitrate powder, and you're looking at $3,000 nowadays. <laughs> you know, I get a jar like this of, of ampicillin, and it's like, you know, two bucks, right? So why use silver nitrate? But these are kind of classical things. Uh, you can see uh, kind of traditionally, a lot of people used to have these copper jugs, and the water would never go stale or anything like that. And that's because it has antimicrobial properties. I'm starting to see with the coronavirus, there was a bunch of advertising around copper things. I don't know if anyone else saw that copper doorknobs and things like that, that are antimicrobial. I saw a little bit of advertising around that, uh, around the pandemic. Um, and it makes sense, right? If it, if it has antimicrobial properties, but for the most part, not used, we're looking at expensive stuff. So, or toxic things that we don't wanna, we don't wanna uh, go there. Okay, so one more here for, actually two more here for you. Um, another one that is really, really common, there are a group of compounds called aldehydes. So aldehydes, uh, you know, the chemical structure, again, a little chemistry for anybody. An aldehyde looks like this. And then you've got the rest of the compound. So it's got, it's got that on it. And what is that? That is a very reactive uh, chemical functional group, right? Uh, you may have heard of formaldehyde. A formaldehyde is a... a a classical preservative for biological specimens in, in labs and things like that. Uh, it's also a carcinogen. So we're, we kind of moved away from that one there, um, but it's very good at reacting with things, proteins. And what it does, uh, it's actually called a cross linker. So it actually binds things together. So it grabs one protein, grabs the other protein, puts them together and they're stuck with covalent bonds. And that kind of makes them inactive. Um, so the whole bunch of other ones that are not so carcinogenic and nasty, um, some of them are very, very cheap, right? And so you're seeing a lot of these disinfectants. This is a big one that I see in a lot of products. This one here, this ortho, I don't know how to say that. How do you mean? Yeah, that's a lot of consonants in one. Phthala, phthaldehyde. Anyway, that's how I'm going to go with it. OPA, I'm seeing that in tons of products. You get these jugs like this, these four liter jugs, and you dilute them, you know, 10 times. And so, you know, you got four liters that is equivalent to 40 liters of disinfectant, right? And you put them in little disinfectant bottles. And um, I, I never know the names of these. I used to have one that we use in the lab and it, I don't know why they had it. It's pink. We all call it pink gap, right? So it was kind of a good, a good name for it. But you squirt it and then you, you wipe things down. Like I said, I'm seeing this in, in a lot of products. It's OPA and because it's very, very cheap and very effective, right? Um, Although, like I said, I'm seeing a lot of these uh, um, benzalkin uh, chlorides are, are seem to be, I don't know whether they're replacing it or whether they're more effective for viruses. I'm not sure why, uh, why the disinfectant wipes use one over the other. Um, these might be a little more volatile, but I'm not sure. Okay, so one more important one that's worth knowing is something called ethylene oxide. This is a gaseous compound and it is super toxic, but super effective, right? So sometimes you have things that you can't wipe down, you can't get them wet, um, you can't stick them in an autoclave and you don't wanna disassemble the entire thing. So you've got all sorts of instruments that you can see on here like the heart and lung machines, right? 
So you're not going to take that thing apart and you know sterilize every little screw and nut and all those kind of things. So what do you do? You flood it with this ethylene oxide gas, and you can get these. Um, um, kind of looks a little bit like an autoclave. This is going to be vented to outside, and the gas goes through there. It's going to. It's kind of like uh, the aldehydes. It cross links things and it, it, it destroys uh, biological molecules, and um, and then the gas is vented away. So it's very, very effective um, and expensive, but it has its uses. Uh, I'm starting to see, I was looking actually on the internet and apparently a lot of um, manufacturers are starting to use this as well. Um, over UV, I was mentioning like the syringes and the, um, the Petri dishes, uh, apparently they're starting to use ethylene oxide because sometimes UV, like you've got to have that lamp and you've got to have a good angle. If it's not hitting all the angles, it may not be sterile and they have ways to recycle the gas. I said it's expensive. Um, and I guess at a large industrial level, maybe there's some economics that makes it a, a better, better system. But um, some supplies are sterilized this way as well, some plastics as well. But in hospitals, you're looking at certain equipment, like I said, the heart and lung machines and things like that are, are kind of a good one um, to use. So I think um, this is a footnote. Um, we don't use antibiotics as disinfectants, okay? We use them for drugs, but sometimes historically we've seen them as certain products, some antimicrobial products, but usually used for drugs. So I've got that Kahoot we're gonna do. And uh, so we'll flip back to that. And then a couple more things to say about disinfectants. I think we should be done by 20 after here. Let's go to question five. Everyone's loading up the app. Sorry, I was too quick on you. All of the following are antiseptics except. Sorry about that. I didn't mean to go so fast. But it's not a kahoot unless there's some panic in the room. <laughs> so the answer is bleach. Okay, so the question says, which of the following are antiseptics? So antiseptics are usually things we're using on the skin. Okay. So alcohol, yes, iodine and hydrogen peroxide are found in first aid kits, so they better be good on the skin. Bleach you could use, but it's a strong chemical. It might burn if it's concentrated enough. You don't usually want to use that as an antiseptic. Okay, Q is still in the lead. Uh, number six, medical manufacturers use this method. I just said it. We're talking about 45 seconds ago. We we're just talking about this thing. So hopefully everyone gets it. How does silver nitrate like make the baby like not go blind? Uh, cause it, cause it, cause your, your eye washes itself, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's just, you know, you've got membranes and protective layers, so it's not getting into the tissues. It's just killing bacteria. There. So right answer is this one here, ethylene oxide gas. I was just mentioning used for some plastic manufacturing. Okay. True or false? Phenols and phenolics are useful because they evaporate quickly. The answer is false. They're useful because they're persistent, right? This is why you see them in floor cleaning products and things like that, because they're going to persist around, right? Okay. Number eight, surfactant refers to alcohols and ethanols. False. Surfactant is soaps and detergents. Okay. Okay. Is it Q? Bronze, Jacob. Well done. Double digit IQ, is that what it says? And the original Q, right? It's gotta be Q. Yeah. Okay. Well done, Q. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, um, there's a couple other things to talk about here. Uh, I, I think I'll just spill them over to next week, uh, but mostly, uh, you know, about five minutes just talking about evaluating disinfectants, right? And um, there's a few different ways to do it. You can see this is talking about the in use test, and this is really just using it where you think you're going to use it. So if you're going to use it in a, let's say, a, a waiting room, right, you can try it out. Maybe next week you try out a different disinfectant and you can swab and see how well it's killing the pathogens there. And, you know, it's kind of like laborious, not necessarily very precise, but, you know, sometimes that's what you have to do is test it where you're going to be using it. Anyway, I'll come back to this next day. Um, we'll see you uh, next, uh, next week.